Uh, my name is Ed Snowden. I'm uh, 29 years old. I work for Booz Allen Hamilton as an infrastructure analyst for NSA uh, in Hawaii. Our first glimpse of Edward Snowden, unremarkable, matter of fact, and yet he's the man who delivered the biggest intelligence leak in history. The world by now familiar with everything that followed. Snowden in exile in Russia. The American intelligence community reeling from his disclosures. These programs are immensely valuable for protecting our nation. What we didn't know and what we will hear tonight are the dramatic spy thriller details inside the Snowden story. It begins with the first contact in Rio de Janeiro. American journalist Glenn Greenwald receives an anonymous email. The sender, eager to share information he says Greenwald needs to see, but only through the secure computer communication of encryption. He makes many attempts to reach out, but Greenwall is juggling other deadlines and demands. He passes on connecting with the unnamed source. As hard as it is to believe, when you first had contact with Edward Snowden, you kind of blew him off. I did. It, it, it was an interesting quandary. And he also wanted you to, to install an encryption system on your well, computer, right? Right, and then he even went further and made a video um, and, and entitled it Encryption for Journalists and used a voice disguising software to walk me through the process. Um, yeah, it, it is amazing to think back that I almost lost the biggest national security leak in probably all of American history, certainly modern American history, because of an unwillingness to install a, what turned out to be a pretty simple program. Weeks later, Greenwall hears from colleague and filmmaker Laura Poitras. She asked to see him about a project she says can only be discussed in person. The two meet and Poitras reveals a series of emails from an anonymous source. He claims to have access to documents proving the U.S. government is spying on its own citizens. In one note, Greenwald hears a genuine voice. So you put it down, you look at Laura Poitras, and you say what? I say, I don't know why, but I think this is real. He said, but I need you to come to Hong Kong and meet me there in order to make this happen. And that was when I told him, you know, I said, look, I, I need some assurance that you are real uh, before I fly all the way across the world and go somewhere I, and walk into something I have no idea what I'm walking into. So I need some actual documents from you. Just to pick some. And after a couple of days, he said, okay, I'm ready to do that. Um, I clicked on a little icon that had appeared on my screen and there were probably about two dozen documents, um, which I just randomly opened. How close to the floor was your jaw when you were looking at that screen? I had physical reactions <laughs> that were so extreme that I, I literally had to, I couldn't read all the documents in order. I had to, I would read a page and I would have to get up and walk around or run around the house um, and breathe deeply. And, you know, it was a combination of um, shock and excitement. But he was making very clear that this was the tiniest tip of the iceberg. The decision is made quickly to meet the source. Greenwald and Poitras board a flight leaving New York City bound for Hong Kong. By now, Greenwall has a thumb drive containing all of the documents. He inserts the drive on his laptop and begins a 16-hour marathon of feverish reading. And the first thing that I noticed was the quantity. I had thousands. I didn't know how many thousands, but I knew I had thousands. You know um, how many thousands now? I've never counted. Um, More you know, than 10,000? Definitely more than 10,000, yeah. More than 100,000? Possibly, I mean, you know, it's, it's a little hard for me to talk about because it involves the charges against Snowden um, and other things, and I have a duty to protect him as, as my source. And not only was it just the, the, the number of it was so vast, but Snowden had cataloged them all in this incredibly precise way. They were all very, um, anally organized in not just files but subfiles and then subfiles to those subfiles and they were labeled by dates and by category and by country and by every other conceivable 
uh, means of reference and every time I would click on them all of the documents would correspond to the title. Not a single document was misfiled. Are you sitting alone? Like, is there somebody sitting beside There's you? There's somebody sitting beside me. Somebody you know? No, a, a perfect stranger. Um, so I'm obviously, you know, cognizant of the need not to let anybody else see my computer screen. I mean, fortunately, I was sitting next to the window, so I was able to just continuously lean against the window and tilt my screen towards me. I mean, in retrospect, it might not have been the most prudent thing to do to be reading archives full of thousands of top secret documents just in the open on an airplane. Um, but that, you know, I, I just, that I, I wasn't thinking that way. Was there a moment at all on that plane ride? Because is there a point at which even Glenn Greenwald says, you know what, I can't print that? As we discussed, I mean, there are many, many, many tens of thousands of documents that um, have been in my possession for 10 months. And over that time, a small fraction of them have been published precisely because I'm not engaged in a project of just indiscriminately dumping information or publishing whatever it is that I happen to find that will make a splash. There's all sorts of things that would make an enormous impact. Um, that we have affirmatively decided not to publish because to do so would to be to harm innocent people or jeopardize their lives. For those who inhabit the American intelligence world, the decision to publish that degree of top secret information is reckless and the consequences incalculable. Retired General Michael Hayden is former Chief of the National Security Agency and Director of the CIA. After 9-11, Hayden oversaw a new aggressive approach by the intelligence community. Some describe him as a key architect of the American surveillance state. What do you think of Glenn Greenwald? He's made quite clear that there are documents that he's seen that he thinks go beyond uh, where journalism should go. Mm -hmm. That he's drawing the line. Right. And his qualifications for that decision? He's a journalist. <laughs> right. So he's unqualified to make that decision? I would say he's less qualified than the British, the American, or the Australian government who have decided that they have a legitimate reason for keeping these secret. This stuff's complicated. It's complicated for somebody like me. And now you've got somebody without that background feeling as if they can make these judgments. And in our systems, well, the, the journalist finally makes the final call. But then the journalist has to take responsibility for the consequences. And I'm telling you, the consequences in this case have been very destructive. Glenn Greenwald arrives in Hong Kong late in the night. He has by now absorbed many of the documents, including, for the first time, the name of his source, Edward Snowden, the man he's eager to meet. Fearful of being watched, Snowden proposes a detailed plan to meet at his hotel. He had picked a place on the third floor of this hotel which was a public space for conference rooms, which as he described it, was sufficiently out of the way so that we wouldn't be viewed by a lot of people, there wouldn't be a lot of human traffic. And then at maybe 1021, a minute after we got there, um, I heard the door open Stop. to this room. So you know his name, but you have no idea what he looks like. But in your mind, you must have had an image, at least in your mind, of what you thought this person was going to look like. Oh, right? definitely. I mean, I had a very distinct image that he was in his 60s or 70s, that he was very kind of senior and world-weary. So and instead, <laughs> instead came I into the room holding a Rubik's Cube. Um, when he walked into the room, I didn't want to turn around and seem overly eager. <laughs> so I just sort of stayed in the position I was at, which was staring at the back wall where there was a mirror. Um, and I see this figure approaching us, and I actually saw the Rubik's Cube in the mirror. And so when he got near us, I turned around, and standing there was, you know, this kind of scrawny, pale, awkward-looking, um, you know, kid. I mean, he was 29, but he looked much younger. He ended up going up to the room. Right. He invited us back to his room. Um, and, and it and was a mess, too, right? He, he, he it was a complete mess. There were room service trays piled up. Um, there were clothes strewn about everywhere. It was a nice room. It was a nice hotel, but it was a, a very small room. He, yeah, he, he demanded that to look at our, our cell phones. Um, he insisted that we put them in the refrigerator because the, the way in which the refrigerator is sealed prevents the audio from being detected by the, 
the cell phones. And so we pretty much instantly got right down to it. And for me, that meant getting all my questions answered. Um, and I had an enormous number of questions about- but central to those questions was what, motivation? Yeah, I mean, I needed to understand why somebody would do that. Um, and most importantly, in the five or six hours that I subjected him to questioning that day without even letting him get a glass of water, go to the bathroom, there was not a moment of inconsistency or hesitation where I sensed that he was doing anything other than telling the complete truth. The uh, scope of these the uh, surveillance is programs is the NSA. And so they publish a shock and awe series of reports, five consecutive days of pounding coverage as Greenwald had planned it. In those first stories, we learn the NSA is collecting telephone records and emails of millions of Americans through a government approved court order and programs like PRISM. For ordinary people, the idea of government surveillance is made real. What would have been happening? This stuff comes out, yeah. you, you, know, you know it shouldn't be unclassified, it shouldn't be out there, right. what do you do? You call your counterintelligence folks and your security folks and you simply say, what do we know? Do we have any, any, any idea who this might be? And there was almost immediate suspicion pointing towards Hawaii and, and this young contractor who was no longer at work. Then they would know also what he had access to. It's a difficult problem, and even today, the agency makes it quite clear that they can detect that he touched 1.7 million documents. They saw him searching. They really don't know how many he then decided to download. So there's a, there's a giant unknown here in terms of what might be out there more lurking to cause additional damage to American and allied security. When we come back, the inside story takes a dramatic turn when the source goes public and becomes a man on the run. Congratulations on the scoop. Explain for our viewers why this is important. There is a potential downside. With Prism is responsible. For Glenn Greenwald percent. continues to do the round of international media while the world wonders who is the source. Snowden tells Greenwald he ultimately wants to reveal himself, explain his motivation, own his story. Finally then, Edward Snowden emerges in a video loaded onto the Guardian website. While the initial stories were explosive, the impact of the video is far more powerful. The greatest fear that I have regarding um, the outcome uh, for America of these disclosures is that nothing will change. He broke his trust. He has caused great harm to the United States. And let me characterize this for you. This is the greatest hemorrhaging of a legitimate American secrets in the history of the Republic. We, we talk about leakers, right? And, and so the metaphor is water. So how bad was the leak? Was it a cup? Was it a bucket? Was it a barrel? Okay. Well, Snowden's different. Snowden's the plumbing. Snowden has not revealed an American secret. He's revealed the architecture the tactics, techniques, and procedures as to how America gains other countries' secrets. And that's why this damage is going to be so severe and very long-lasting. Having revealed himself, it's just a matter of time before the world's media come looking for Edward Snowden. The morning after Snowden goes public, Greenwald walks into a wall of media the instant he leaves his room, all of them hoping Greenwald will help point the way to his source. As Greenwald indulges journalists' questions, in another part of the city, Snowden has begun changing his appearance and making plans to go underground. In the days that follow, Greenwald continues to release more documents and reports on them. What Greenwald considers the most important revelation is what he calls the NSA's Collect It All agenda. Targeting the communications of Americans, one document reveals how agencies are encouraged to collect it all, process it all, sniff it all. So much of this sort of collect it all, sniff it all, I think is one of the phrases right. they use, is a result obviously of, of, of the post 9-11 period and the direction that was given to security agencies of never again. But given that order, what are security agencies supposed to do other than do sniff it all? You know, the word terrorism and 9-11 and all of that packs an incredibly potent emotional punch. 
The issue is that do you trust a government to be able to have free reign over people's communications without any limitations on what they can do simply because they utter the word terrorism enough times? The threat of people like Michael Hayden when they can bump into your Gmail accounts, meaning the Gmail accounts of political dissidents to the United States or to opponents to his policies, is so much greater than the threat of terrorism to an American citizen or the average Canadian citizen. Um, we are creating a far greater danger than the threat that it's supposedly intended to prevent. This story is, is rushed out all right, through people reading documents, documents that are very difficult to understand, even for me. And so we've got urban legends out there that prompt the kind of question you're saying. NSA is reading every email in the universe. Well, have I mean, a access to well, every well, email in the universe. Well, wouldn't the you want CSEC or NSA or GCHQ to be able to go where Canadian or British or American security interests demanded they go? Well, it's not about where I want it to go. It's about where governments say it does go. Now, now you're making a distinction here, Peter. Okay, you're making a distinction between capacity and fact, capacity and actual performance, what is done. You, you, you just said, read all emails on the internet. Right. On any given day, NSA touches 1.6% of internet traffic and actually brings in and does something to 0.00004%. But I'm still concerned about 1.6, great. I'm happy to have that discussion, but let's not begin the discussion with my trying to defend we read everything all the time of everybody. I, I love the Snowden quote. It covers your text messages, your web history, your searches you've ever made. That's Google. That's not NSA. The Snowden affair sparked a global debate about government surveillance and privacy and why it matters. Greenwald and Hayden are now compelling voices for opposing sides in that debate. Privacy is a unique guarantee of human freedom. It's where creativity and dissent and exploration reside. And when that is gone, so too is a crucial part of human freedom. As for the seemingly unremarkable man who started it all, Edward Snowden remains in exile in a secret location in Russia. What's your sense of his mood right now, Snowden's mood? I would say very gratified more than anything else because the mission that he set out to achieve is one that I think he believes has largely been achieved which is to safely get this information to the public. And he's done all that while remaining outside of the reach of the U.S. government and not in prison. But he can't go home. He can't go home, and, and that's the sacrifice that he made, and, and that's what makes his act so noble. I, I characterize him as a defector. A defector. Right. Can you see the possibility that the day exists where he comes home to no charges? No. I could think of no step that would more alienate the American intelligence community than that. I'd, I'd add one additional thought. If, if what you described were to happen, it would be an object lesson for every Edward Snowden in the future, that if you're gonna steal American secrets, make sure you steal enough to cut yourself a deal. His deal is to live in Russia. He, life has choices. And therefore, he chose a course of action that has him in exile in an autocratic state. This is the truth. This is what's happening. You should decide whether we need to be doing this.